Welcome to Play and Learning Styles for Young Children, presented by Starnet Region 6. Fred Rogers talks about the importance of play with young children. Play is their job. It's how children explore their world and try new things. Take just a moment to think about what play means to you. This is Nacy's stance on play. In addition, it helps combat obesity, it reduces stress in children, and it helps show them how to relate to their world. Playing is how children learn. It's how they developed and how they make the most of their new skills and abilities. So play and learning are not separate activities. Children play and they learn the entire time that they're playing. For example, when a child is playing restaurant in the Dramatic Play Center, they are writing and drawing menus, setting prices, taking orders, cooking the food, delivering the food, making out checks, cleaning up dishes. This means they are practicing organization skills, math skills, literacy skills, fine motor skills, problem solving, working together, how to listen and interact with others, and so much more. So not every child is the sit down with Legos or dress up as a princess kind of person. That's okay. You just need to figure out ways to incorporate play that are fun and comfortable for the child. Sometimes they might need you to kickstart their play. You don't need to be there the whole time, but they need you to be there to get them started. Use a play script or model how to play for them. So again, Mr. Rogers says, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is the serious learning. Think about if you've ever heard, it's preschool, they're just playing. It's not just playing, it is their job and they're taking it seriously. Everything we do that's intentional comes back around to the why. This is the why of play, the serious learning opportunities afforded to the children as they play. So just take a minute to think about how a child plays and then consider as you're watching what does the play tell you about that child's development how are they using their senses to explore new objects new environments or try new things what's interesting to the child what will spark that continuation of a critical thinking or problem solving in order to get their interests or their questions answered? And is your environment safe and inviting so the child can play and learn? So the physical part of play, they're developing and coordinating their gross and fine motor skills. They're improving their hand-eye coordination. They are getting a better awareness of their own body, their space, their direction, they are enhancing concentration, they are learning and enhancing their well-being. You need to make sure your room has enough space for movement, particularly because movement breaks can get out the fidgets and they provide sensory breaks for children. So cognitively, play helps build and strengthen neural connections. It is the backbone of learning. Critical thinking, language, self-regulation, decision-making, problem-solving, executive functioning, literacy skills, math skills, social-emotional skills, all these develop in a young child through play. Howard Gardner, who developed the multiple intelligences theory, states that when children play, their brains are engaged in pattern-seeking processes. This helps them construct, 
organize and synthesize information. When you are watching a child play, try to resist that temptation to ask a lot of questions about what they are playing right away. Instead, jump in and start playing with them, taking their conversational cues. So think about, as children are playing, the language and literacy skills that are developing. They develop oral language skills as they play with peers or interact with staff, and they need those to develop in order to be successful at reading. When children are playing in a classroom filled with print and language and literacy play, they get to experience the joy and power associated with reading and writing. NACI has shown that these are strong predictors of future educational achievement. Think about where you have language and literacy in your classroom. There might be menus in the Dramatic Play Center. There's books in the library. There's building directions in the Block Center. There are experiment designs in science. Socially, Play provides the perfect setting to develop those social emotional skills. They practice self-regulation. They learn to interact with peers. They develop friendship skills, problem solving skills, critical thinking skills. Uh, Mildred Parton in 1932 defined six levels of social development in play. Think about it and can you define any of the types of play? Can you identify them in your classroom? Unoccupied play is the least common form of play, and it's when the children's behavior seems more random and without a specific goal. In solitary play, children play by themselves, they don't interact with others, and they are not engaging in similar activities to those around them. With onlooker play, they are observing other children playing they might comment on the activities the other children are involved in. They might even make suggestions, but they do not directly join in the play. With parallel play, children play alongside each other and they use similar toys and they're performing similar activities, but they are not directly interacting with each other. With associative play, children interact with each other and share toys, but they are not working toward a common goal. It is cooperative play when children are interacting to achieve a common goal and they may take on different tasks to reach that goal, such as if they're playing restaurant, one may be a cook, one might be a waiter, one might do the dishes, and one might take orders. Sometimes parents and some staff are concerned that children aren't doing worksheets when they are in a play-based program. The problem with worksheets is there's a right or wrong answer on a worksheet. So when children are afraid of getting the wrong answer, they will be less willing to take a risk by guessing, which then does not allow problem solving. Um, if we want children to learn to solve problems, we have to provide a safe environment where they are confident in taking risks, making mistakes, learning for them, and trying again. At this age, children are at the concrete stage. Abstract symbol representation is non-existent or just emerging. They may be, ide they may be able to identify the letters R, U, N on a worksheet, but then be unable to recognize the word run in a book. Success or failure on a worksheet does not signify the child's ability to read, understand, or comprehend those letters. With worksheets, children are less encouraged to have help from their peers. There are few situations in the adult world where we can't ask a friend or coworker for help or ideas about a problem. Leaders in business and industry look for employees who can solve problems in teams, yet we ask children to do what are sometimes impossible tasks for them on a worksheet and to do them alone. When they are playing, 
they are free to ask others to help them get to their goal. This is the time to build the foundation for social relationships. It is much more difficult to do that with a worksheet. So why do we want to see high level play in our classroom? We want children to be highly engaged with the activity for an extended period of time. That's how you start to dive deep into critical thinking and problem solving skills. When children are playing together, involved towards a common goal, there are fewer behavioral problems. With high level play, the noise level is at a reasonable level because children are not wandering here and there looking for something to do. They handle their problems independently, only calling on adults for specific needs. Materials can be used very creatively. Is this a measuring cup or is this a Or is it a magic cup that will give a child superpowers? Finally, children will assign roles to each other to create a play scenario which helps them achieve their play goal. So from NACI, as you prepare materials for a center or an activity, ask yourself, what specific purpose does each material serve? What are the children doing, talking about, trying out? This will give you an idea about what they might be thinking. How can you add complexity, introduce vocabulary, or prompt higher level thinking with these materials? Do you see their engagement with materials change as you offer suggestions or guidance? The play prep must be very intentional. Someone should be able to go into your room, hold up any object, and you should be able to say why it's there and what children are learning from it. So even though we want all children to learn by play, you set children up for failure when you expect everyone to learn and play in the exact same way. So Howard Gardner in the early 1980s put forth the theory that different children learn in different ways. He defines intelligence as the ability to solve problems that you encounter in real life, the ability to generate new problems to solve, and the ability to make something or offer a service that is valued within one's culture. It is the how they work with those abilities that make the different learning styles. In Gardner's theory, there are eight different multiple intelligences. There is the auditory, the visual, kinesthetic, logical, mathematic, musical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and the naturalist intelligence. While we're, there are eight different multiple intelligences, for the purpose of this presentation, we will talk about just three, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. In order to best individualize and intentionally set up our classroom, we need to know what type of learner a child is. The three here, kinesthetic, visual, and auditory are the most common types of learners. There are many different types of learning style inventories or quizzes some for early childhood, some for adults, some for middle school, all different ages. It can be helpful to identify your own learning style before figuring it out for the students. Many people have more than one learning style when you look at all eight. Someone might be an auditory learner and also an intrapersonal and a musical learner. 
So for example, when you're giving a direction, you can engage all three types of learners by saying, show me your eyes, listen to my words, and turn towards me. All three ask someone to engage with you in the way that works best for them. When you're sitting at a small group, look at this letter. Listen as I say this letter. Trace this letter. The kinesthetic learner is the most physical of all the learning styles. It refers to our ability to sense body position and movement. This means that if a child is really to understand something and they are a kinesthetic learner, they need to touch it, feel it, move it around. For example, this kind of learner tends to use a lot of gestures or she may count on her fingers or clap along while he is counting. There are students who are walking, bobbing, fidgeting while they're listening and taking in everything that's being taught. Making a kinesthetic learner sit still, sit crisscross applesauce, or be still, means that now they are just thinking about sitting still because it's hard for them. They may not even be listening to what you're saying anymore because they're focusing so much on staying still. Kinesthetic learners may have exhibited some of these characteristics as babies or toddlers by being early crawlers and walkers, or especially physical babies. If so, these strengths have probably stayed with them as they've grown older. Here are some indications that a child might be a kinesthetic learner. They're just indications. It doesn't mean that they definitely are. They're good at physical activities. Tend to fidget in their seat because they may need to move around to truly process information. They talk with a frequent use of gestures. They love hands-on activities and play acting. They have had early physical development, such as being early walkers, crawlers, or sitters. They can be easily overwhelmed with print. If a child says, let me hold that, instead of let me see that, they might be a kinesthetic learner. These are the kids who love building sets, model kits, and interactive displays. They often tear things apart so they can learn about them. If kinesthetic learners are offered a choice in art class, they will choose modeling clay over pencil and paper. From an early age, they will reach for books that encourage interactions, pop-ups, little doors that open and close, or books with textures that can be touched or petted. So how can you support kinesthetic learning in your classroom. Whenever possible, offer things that they can hold in their hands. Physical math manipulatives such as pattern blocks and base 10 blocks can help kinesthetic learners internalize a new math concept. Help practice spelling by getting them letter-shaped magnets that they can move around on a pan. Give kinesthetic learners textured paper to write on and a variety of different sized pencils and pens to choose from. Have textured letters that they can trace. Add motion to your learning. Have them sit in an exercise ball instead of a chair. Let them stand or walk in a taped box during circle. Give them fidgets or props during story time. Add rhythmic motions like hand clapping or finger snapping when reading and practicing math skills. Encourage them if you notice them unconsciously using hand movements to help themselves remember. If it gets too loud, just remind them to use quieter alternatives. To keep them from being overwhelmed, teach them to use deep breathing and relaxation techniques to help with focus. Break up tasks into manageable segments. Make sure things are hands-on, hands-on, hands-on. Being a kinesthetic learner is not always about being up and out of your chair. These are some examples of physical play. Take a minute to think about what are the children learning here? 
Then we come to auditory learners. These are the learners who are drawn to sound. They learn best by hearing things, by listening to you talk about it or being read to. They might be especially musical and show an aptitude for playing instruments or singing. Later, they may be identified as having a musical intelligence. They have the ability to listen well and follow verbal directions. They often have a love of talking and discussions. Only 30% of school-aged children are auditory learners. We need to keep this in mind and individualize at the earliest age. Auditory learners means they remember and understand new concepts better when they are explained out loud, even if they're doing the speaking themselves. They may need to talk it out to themselves as they learn a new concept. They can be better, they can better retain knowledge when new ideas are paired with nonverbal sounds such as clapping, drum beats, or music. So much of pre-K is already auditory and that we sing. So some indications that a child may be an auditory learner. They tend to sing along to songs or create their own song or wordplay as they play. They have strong verbal ability and are able to listen well and follow verbal directions. Again, they have a love for talking and discussions. They may perk up when they hear music or when they hear people talking. They talk themselves through tasks, especially through repetition of words or phrases that they've heard before. If they don't understand something, they will often say, tell me again. They would much rather have someone read a story to them than look at it themselves. So how do you support an auditory learner? Encourage them to say things out loud, repeat what you've said, and promote listening to books, read alouds or recorded. Talk through your directions and your instructions. Use music and songs to teach. Suggest making up silly songs or word plays about something that they're learning. Auditory learners are often intrigued by wordplay and language patterns. Explain the pictures in books or tasks. And then we have visual learners. This is the learner who learns best by reading or seeing pictures. Things are best understood and remembered by sight. They need to see what they are learning. They may be drawn to art and they may doodle while they're listening. They can often have a good sense of direction and an understanding of maps. They have an aptitude in reading and a love of books. Recognition of people comes from identifying their faces. And they may have a keen interest in observing the world around them. So some indications a child may be a visual learner. They may have a vivid imagination and draw things that they imagine. They may have an interest in art, painting, drawing, or crafts. They may have a strong memory that relays visually observed information and an aptitude in reading and a love of books. These are kids who will be at the art center a lot or the library. They will follow you as, they, as you point to pictures or charts. They may send, spend time in the tech center looking and watching. So how do we support a visual learner? As you talk, point to a word or a picture to underscore what you're talking about. Make sure you use posters or visuals especially for things they may be struggling with. Surround them with books and pictures. Make sure that you have bright color visuals that draw the eye. Visual learners can create drawings to help remember important facts, identify the ele main elements of a storyline, and solidify the meaning of new words in their heads. 
So here's an example of how to make centers work for every kind of learners. In the block center, you can have posters showing what they will do, what they can build, how they can build it. For our auditory learner in the block center, we can have directions that we sing. We can figure out ways to make word plays on how to build a tower. For our kinesthetic learners, they're touching the blocks. Use them to make letters. Preschoolers are known for acting with impulse, so dramatic play is a great stepping stone for learning to self-regulate their emotions and actions. When children assign and accept roles in dramatic play, they are motivated to stick to them, thinking of them as rules to follow, their own rules. This helps develop the ability to coordinate and plan with others, as well as to control their impulses. So we want to encourage all types of learners to play a dramatic play. When you look at this dramatic play center, we have pictures, we have words, we have books that are defining what we can do here. For our auditory learners, we have music, finger plays. Kids in dramatic play are having conversations, working out problems, and role playing. This is an example of a dramatic play center where visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners can all work together towards their common goal. In the Science Center, this one is a pretty self-explanatory way to teach a visual learner. We have pic picture representations of the items that we're trying to teach. Again, this one's pretty self-explanatory, but by incorporating sound into our Science Center, we can interest our auditory learners into going over there. Centers should be designed to focus on one, more than one style of learning. That's what we want because we want all kids to be able to learn from that center. Getting them up and moving in a representation of the science concept is the way to reach your kinesthetic learner. The library is the built-in place for visual learners. They look at things, they read, eventually they will write things down. For the auditory learners, they can really excel in the library. Read them books, let them listen to books on tape, or put yourself on YouTube reading the story and allow them to watch and listen. For the kinesthetic learner, act out the story and use props. As children grow, their favored way to learn won't be the only way. They'll learn in different ways. The visual learner may end up also being a very interpersonal or mathematical learner and so on. It get, by supporting them early, we give them the basis of starting to learn in their most comfortable way. So think about it for yourself. Use your own learning style to figure out one thing you learned today and two things you'll try in class. Make an intentional plan to include more learning styles into your classroom day. Thank you so much for being with us and listening to this webinar on play and learning styles in young children.